Oh, 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 oh. Hey. Yeah. I see a Canadian circus. Do you? So before we get to the movie, I want to talk about my most recent trip to the thrift store, where I scored Miller's Crossing Blu-ray. That's a movie you and I both like. The picture on this is so clear mm -hmm. that when Bernie Birnbaum says, Look at your heart, Tom! You can actually see into Tom Regan's heart. The clarity. I tell it, it the picture is so clear mm -hmm. that when Johnny Casper says to his son, What did you eat today? And the kid says, Hot dog and mustard. You can see, you already know what the kid ate. You can see. It's his that clear. Turning away. I really can't tell the difference between Blue, no, I can't. And, I really and can't. DVD. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. This is the second movie of Cartoon June, and I thought it was about time we have a little more anime on the show. Hopefully this is a good movie and will leave us with some fond memories. I've never heard of this movie. Or do I? And maybe something just took it out of my head. Wah! <laughs> Released in 1995, Memories is an anthology of three short films based on the manga of Basement Hall of Famer Katsuhiro Otomo. It's about time he comes back. Otomo directs one of the pieces, and another one was written by Basement alum Satoshi Khan. Okay, what do you think of this? I think it's neat. Yes, oh, yes. we're going to watch a movie. It's great. All right, well, your gift tonight is a little treat that I think will go well with this movie. It is a little treat that should go well with the movie. It's Pocky Six! Chocolate cream covered biscuit sticks. Yeah, I am a fan of these. Let's crack them open and have some. There you go. Cheers. Cheers. Tastes like a chocolate cookie. Basically. Yeah. What more do you want out of this life? Tastes like those cookies that had the chocolate on. Had the chocolate on, yeah. Yeah. Fudge stripe cookies. Keebler. Mmm. Yeah. Yes. Tastes like that. Well, come over and join us on the old leather coach. I know you remember how to get there as we sit and enjoy some Japanese cartoons and watch memories. All right, Craig, let's start the show. <laughs> oh, we already did it. Sorry, I, I forgot. Oh, Matt. Madness memories. <laughs> Memories are made of this. The first of our tales is called Magnetic Rose. The salvage ship Corona is in the middle of a huge field of space junk. The crew consists of Ivanov, Aoshima. Smoking in space? When you smoke in a pressurized environment like this, you get to smoke the same cigarette for a month. Heinz and Miguel. He's the one wearing the Speedos. In outer space, nobody can hear you streak. One of these derelict spacecraft has sent an SOS signal. The distress call is the music of Madame Butterfly. So Heinz and Miguel go down to the ship. I could sing like that if I wanted to, but I'm too busy being funny. <laughs> Can't do both at the same time. <laughs> There's breathable atmosphere in this ship. The radiation levels are low. Here comes the gravity. That's what I say when I'm about to give a beat down. Here comes the gravity. Always go for the lady. The tiger is a jerk. And they find this amazing ballroom. What? Marble and granite and all the nice stuff. Miguel, may I have this dance? Sorry, I'm just overcome by the atmosphere. We get so little of it in space. <laughs> Miguel sees this window looking out on a sunny field. And there's this woman out in the field. Hey, that's a hologram, dummy. Holograms. <sighs> there's my nightmare. Check out all this food. There's a bottle of champagne. Miguel drinks some of it, but it doesn't taste so good. It's Bellatore. Oh. Heinz, catch up. Just hit me right there. Just, just give me a good one right there. <laughs> Things have a tendency to crumble and fall into dust. Oshima, Mirga. 
Uh, in this next room, there's an old guy in a bed, and then there's a fetus hovering over him. What do you suppose that means? There's a big painting, and it's that woman. They find out her name is Eva Friedel. She was an opera singer from around 100 years prior. And she was married to Carlo Rambaldi. He died mysteriously. Miguel keeps seeing these holograms, or maybe they're hallucinations. Thank you, my Tosca has been bothering me lately. I think I haven't been getting enough fiber. But remember that painting we passed before? Now Miguel's in the painting. Heinz says two words that signifies it's a horror movie. Split up. Miguel finds this junky part of the palace. It's full of this swampy water and there's this old janky piano. And he hits a piano key and suddenly everything is beautiful. And there's Eva. No! <laughs> and she calls him Carlo. Introduce me to her sister! Heinz has memories of being back on Earth with his wife and his daughter. Emily just got a brand new spacesuit for her birthday and she wants to go into space with her daddy someday. But then he's brought back to reality. He had an act, well, reality, whatever that is. <laughs> Miguel is basically lost. He thinks that he's Carlo. He thinks that he's in love. None of these ghosts has had the common decency to say, we want you to come play with us forever <laughs> and ever and ever. Come on. <gasps> Memories. Memories. Yeah. Miguel. Miguel, my bell. These are words that go together well. Where are you, Miguel? Heinz encounters Eva. I know what happened. You killed Carlo. Memories. Carlo Eternal, the new scent by Calvin Klein. <laughs> Emily shows up. She's here. Hey, Daddy. Finally, we're in space together. Thank you. Thank you. Oh no, I fell off the roof. Now I'm dead. Meanwhile, the corona is being sucked in by the gravity field, the magnetic field, both, and it's starting to break apart. Everything is dusty. Except, no, that's not what it, no. Uh, what happens after that? Basically, everything just falls apart and everyone dies. Pretty much, yeah. Everyone dies. But not Eva. Oh no, Eva lives forever. Gathering prey from around the galaxy with her magnetic field. Because love never dies. The stink bomb! Look at this dunderhead. Meet Nobuo Tanaka. He's kind of a hypochondriac. He's got this cold. He goes to the lab where he works, and someone tells him there are some special capsules that the chief has been developing. Why don't you go take one of them? I might help you with your cold. Red capsules in a blue case, each one seeking happiness. Well, I guess I'll take some. And then goes and has a nap in the break room. The chief runs in, who's been into my capsules? He's upset, to say the least. Meanwhile, everyone's smelling this funny smell. <laughs> smell of death surrounds you! And it's getting more and more intense. Tanaka wakes up from his nap. Everyone's dead. What happened? Tanaka calls up headquarters back in Tokyo. He talks to Mr. Narasaki. Tanaka! <laughs> I'm the company screw-up. Yep, I'm known for my bungling. <laughs> it's Robotussin with codeine. I really want to get faded on some scissor. He gets the things, he puts them in his briefcase, he gets on his bicycle, and he rides around. Every being that he encounters out there is also dead. The top brass is meeting. Don't ask who farted in the elevator. It was all three of us. The movie's called Stink Bomb, after all. <laughs> Whatever's happening, it has to do with those capsules. It's Godzilla! Again! Blooming flowers! <laughs> this news chopper's flying around. They see Tanaka on the roof. They try to rescue him, but they drop dead. Did I do that? <laughs> Maybe we should stop this guy. Turns out there's a big bioweapon that they're working on. It's these pills. And so he bumbles along to Tokyo. <laughs> Why is everyone so sleepy around here? The army is trying to evacuate the area because the mist is spreading. 
Tanaka goes to, up to these army guys and he says, Hey, help me! We can also conclude that this man is a doofus, possibly a dolt. We need to kill this guy. Oh, Idris Elba, you're no fun. Choppers are deployed and bullets and guns are fired at Tanaka. They all miss. Is he lucky or is it the drugs? That mist is getting into their weapons guidance systems and messing them up. Okay, NASA's getting involved. They say, we've got these space suits. Nothing can get inside them. And we're going to get Tanaka. They're marching down the tunnel. Tanaka's walking down the tunnel. He says, ah, and there's a huge cloud. It really appears as though they finally have stopped the menace of society named Tanaka. Tokyo has been saved. Everyone's celebrating. And one of those astronauts comes into the control room. Oh, this is our hero. We're going to congratulate him. But he opens up his face mask, and it's Tanaka. Oh, I'm glad I finally made it to Tokyo. Somehow he got into one of the spacesuits. How do I get out of this thing? <laughs> Stinks up the whole place. Oh, you goof. Was that too funny of a war story for you? Well, try this on for size. For side. Try it on for side. It's called cannon fodder. A boy wakes up. Gerald McBoing Boing isn't looking so good. He's going to breakfast, but first... Katie! He has to stop at the special picture. I salute Japan's greatest hero, Tanaka. <laughs> His dad's got to go to work, and he's got to go to school. Now, this country is at war. Everything is war. People work for the war. The boy is taught math, but it's the math of war. Dad works on a Cannon 17. It's time to load the cannon. And we see every single step of the process. Yo shit! Yo shit! <laughs> They'll need a crane. They'll need a crane. The cannon is loaded. I certainly hope this cannon is going to shoot memories at someone because <laughs> it would seem to be appropriate. Everyone go away because the big boom is going to go boom. We are at pressure. Repeat. Dun 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 We've got to call the guy who fires the cannon. We think it's that guy who's in the painting that the boy is so admiring of, but this guy's big and fat. Hello, I'm here to shoot a button into space. And boop. And everyone in town cheers. Yay! 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 Back at home, Daddy and Son are watching the news. The news is about the... Everything's about the war. Every molecule of these people's lives is about the war. Hey! Who are we fighting against? You'll understand when you're older. Which means that he doesn't know either. He looks at one of his son's drawings, and the drawing comes to life for a little bit. <laughs> You've destroyed the enemy, Charlie Brown! <laughs> I want to be the guy who pushes the button someday. Not the chump who loads the cannon like his dad. Memories. We watched it, and now we're going to remember it. It was hard for me to take notes of this one. Yeah, a lot happens, particularly in that first story. Well, I want to start off by saying I think this is the best animation we've had on this show before. It's pretty amazing. All the animation styles fit the stories. Mm -hmm. The first one is kind of this hard sci-fi. The Eon Flux cartoon that was on MTV yeah, 20 yeah. years ago, 30 The second years ago. one is just a straight-up cartoon, mm -hmm. and then the third one is this very surreal, almost Soviet-looking yes. type of animation. Yeah, fits in very well with the fascist storyline. Now we have two of these that are clearly satires. Mm -hmm. Stink Bomb, weapons of mass destruction are too easily accessed by fools. Yes. Cannon fodder, which is the pointlessness of war, particularly when you don't know who you're fighting and you stop thinking about it. Is there any satire in Magnetic Rose? No. I don't think so. It's a vanity, selfishness, male lust. All of those themes are in that movie, but it's uh, not in a way that's satirical. Do you think that inconsistency is a flaw of the film? Is it a flaw? Yeah, if you wanted to look at it that way. But I really think that they had three 
stories that weren't long enough to be movies. Mm -hmm. And they just put them together. I do think that Magnetic Rose very well could have been a full movie. It didn't give enough time to that whole story. They could have taken more time developing the characters of these guys before they sent them into the derelict spacecraft. Yeah, but that one was... I would say the highlight of the three. I kind of like the other two more. Oh, I... The world of cannon fodder. It's sort of this ultimate dystopia. Everything is war. Home is war. School is war. This is really driven home by the fact that there's a scene with a protester. Mm -hmm. And he's not protesting war. Yeah. He's protesting the unsafe uh, toxicity of the gunpowder <laughs> yes, that we like, use to shoot off the can. Yeah, we need better gunpowder. <laughs> right. That's better for us because we don't want to die. Even thinking... Anything against the war is so driven out of these people's lives. There's the question of whether or not they are actually at war. It seems as though the father knows that they're just shooting missiles to nowhere. Our enemy was destroyed generations ago, but we just keep doing this because it's all we know. The boy doesn't wake up at the end when the alarms go off. The alarms are probably just for show, too. We have never had a fool like Tanaka on this show. No, and we've had Don Knotts on this show. <laughs> That's how you make it through to the finish line. If you have the right idiot, he'll just dodge all the bullets and destroy the world. Why flowers? The flowers thing never really made well, sense Well, flowers. How is there a better symbol of peace than a flower? Flower power. Yeah, I guess so. So that's what's killing everyone. <laughs> a section of this movie I do want to watch again was when they loaded up the gun. Because I didn't realize until well into that sequence that it was a tracking shot. You know what the problem with tracking shots is? You don't know at the beginning of the tracking shot that you're watching a tracking shot. You always ask that question, has this been this one shot this whole time? Yeah, I haven't been appreciating it as much as I should this wonderful tracking shot they're giving me. We've been watching movies our whole lives. Mm -hmm. We're so used to cuts yeah. that we don't notice when they're not there. There's a detail in Magnetic Rose that I don't know if is intentional. It's October 12th, it's Columbus Day. And 2092 would be the 600th anniversary of Columbus Day. Right. Add to that Madama Butterfly, which is an opera about colonialism. Huh. And yet, I don't think that's intentional. Because there's really nothing colonial about what these guys are doing. They're the, responding to a distress call. Their jobs aren't to take over other planets. Their jobs are to clean up old satellites. They're not exploiting anybody. That is a weird detail. Yeah. What are some favorite images from the movie? Just the floating space junk was yeah, beautiful. That was amazing, yeah. The little drawing that comes to life, that was yeah. really neat. A cartoon within a cartoon. How often do you see that? I think that we can agree that it's not a great title. No. The theme of memory doesn't run through them. No. And it's not very interesting. No. Can you think of a better title for this trio of stories? Okay, sci-fi. The Impotent Bullet. Of course, nobody wants to see a movie about impotency, but in the entire movie, and this is the one thing the three have in common, the bullets don't land. Thank you for watching Memories with us. The show's not over yet. No. Because now it's time for us to remember some other movies in a segment we call Seen It. Seen It. Our theme for Seen It, of course, is anime. And we've got all these DVDs that were sent to us in our P.O. box. We watched them and we're going to talk about them. Lupin the Third, The Castle of Castigliano. Cagliastro? Cagliastro? Yeah, okay. The Castle of Cagliastro. Seen it. Seen it. I've also seen it. This is Hayao Miyazaki's first film. It's from yes. 1979. It was based on a Japanese animated series from the early 70s. Mm -hmm. This is an adventure story. It reminded me a lot of the adventures of Tintin. Because like Tintin, it is nonstop. Every single scene, there is some great action going on. It doesn't look like 1979. It doesn't look like any cartoon being made in the world in 1979. The colors are so great. I do feel like Miyazaki has yet to find his voice. Mm. It sort of feels like he's doing a job rather than presenting us with this inspired vision. Yes. Well, that was Miyazaki's first film, and now we have here Satoshi Kon's first film, Perfect Blue. Seen, Seen it. it. This is a very mind-bending movie. It is a mystery. Uh, it's very graphic at times, Quite graphic. And I kind of don't want to talk about it because it's a mystery that deserves to be taken without any prior knowledge. Yeah. My advice would be don't try and figure it out while it's happening. Just, you know, the character in the movie is on kind of a ride. Just go on the ride with her. And then when the movie's over, you've taken in as much as you can. 
And looking back on it, you'll be able to piece things together and figure it out. That's what happened with me. Yes. I got to the end of the movie. I was lost. Five minutes later, I had everything figured out. Oh, and it's a movie from the late 90s. And if you really want to take a trip down memory lane, you can watch Perfect Blue and watch one of the characters explain to the other what a website is. <laughs> the Boy and the Beast. Seen it. Seen it. This seems to be a very classic theme in anime movies. Where a young boy or a young girl is kind of drawn into this fantastical world. Mm -hmm. And at some point they need to make a choice. Do I go back to being a normal human or do I go full into this other realm? Yeah. We see this in the Wolf Children film. We see it in Spirited Away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not all this movie is because you've seen this movie before. Even, even if you've never heard it. Of it. It is the story of the master who does not want to take on an apprentice and the apprentice who's a rebel. Do they end up liking each other and teaching each other valuable lessons and end up fighting for good? And do they end up winning? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let you guess on that one. Okay, we began with Miyazaki. We're closing with Miyazaki. We have Kiki's Delivery Service. Seen it. Seen it. I watched this as a double feature. This was the second feature of the evening. Do you want to know what the first one was? It was Mike Nichols' Carnal Knowledge. <laughs> and believe me, after that movie, I needed a palate cleanser. Yeah. And this was the perfect movie. Wow. I just, Yeah, <laughs> that would be the perfect movie. It's like, yay, we can all work together, and I'm a girl who can do things. Of all of Miyazaki's films, this is one of his least weird. It's a simple story. Girl leaves home, starts a small business. Her little cat, Gigi, is just such a lovely design. Of course, I'm going to love a black cat in an animated movie. The animators know exactly how black cats move, how they jump, how they interact with things. It was all perfectly done. I live with two black cats, and I know these things. And they got an A-plus in that. And, of course, Phil Hartman doing oh, the voice. Oh, yeah, that's right. He does do the voice for he that. He does the voice like this. Wow, what a snob. And that cat. And at first you think, is that how he's going to do it? But it's perfect because he makes the cat blase and high strung at the same time. <laughs> I have nothing to add. There's a place you can go to where you won't encounter murderous opera stars. You won't encounter killing smells. And you won't encounter a giant cannon. It's our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. All of our episodes are there. There are also PayPal donation buttons. You click them with your mouse, and you can donate to help support our show. Yes, like this person who we're about to talk about now. It's Robin. Robin? Who says, what fight scene in movie, play, or TV show did you appreciate more because it had an awesome song to go with it? Personally, I love the bakery fight scene in Umbrella Academy because they fought to Istanbul by They Might Be Giants. <laughs> there is a movie trope, and it's a trope because it works, where you have an intensely violent or intensely action action scene, and you score it with a very gentle song. The first instance of this that I can think of is Danny Boy in Miller's Crossing which is a great use of that song and probably one of the best scenes in a movie I've ever seen. My favorite music fight scene is in Shaun of the Dead. Don't Stop Me Now by Queen when they're beating up on the, on the zombies. And Robin informs us that she has an original Tona art piece. What? It was bought for her by her best friend Charlie Smith. Cool! Yeah, that is cool. You can also watch us open our mail on the unboxing show, which comes out this coming Friday. A sister show to Welcome to the Basement. It's the end of Cartoon June, but don't be sad because Sci-Fi July is just around the corner and there's going to be three episodes in July. Oh! What sci-fi movies do you think we're going to watch in July? You let us know in the comments. And right now, you can watch this. You know, this does remind me of memories when I grew up in some sort of war-torn society that was just fighting this endless war and then this really stinky guy showed up <laughs> and I went out of space and met a met, met some sort of weird yeah. opera singer you've had all these memories all these memories okay. happened to me and we were all talking Japanese we uh, was I involved yeah you were the guy who shot the gun oh now